So we are very uh, supportive of initiatives to decentralize both the political order and the commercial order and take decision-making powers away from the center. Uh, and I'll finish on this by saying that we saw a perfect example almost of this intense centralization through lockdowns. We got a one-size-fits-all virtually policy solution for 60 million very different people. That shouldn't be allowed to happen again. Hello, and welcome to the Solutions Podcast. My name is David Ansara, the host of the show. And I am delighted to be doing something a little bit different in terms of format. This week, I am at the Sakelika offices in Pretoria, and I'm doing my very first in-person podcast interview. And as much as I enjoy conducting interviews over Zoom, there's nothing quite like the face-to-face -face interaction of being in the same room with a guest having an important and meaningful conversation, which is exactly what I intend to do today with the CEO of Sakelika, Piet Leroux. This is the second time that he has appeared on the show. And also appearing for the second time is Russell Lamberti, he is the uh, head of strategic engagement. Is that correct, uh, Russ? Research and strategy. Research and strategy. And uh, so, gentlemen, thank you very much for, for hosting me. And it's great to have you both on. But uh, viewers of the show will be familiar with the work of Saki Licha. It's a business advocacy group. We do a lot of uh, campaigning and uh, litigation, but also helping to build state-proof businesses. Um, and we're operating in an environment where state policy is actively hostile towards the private sector. Uh, there's a raft of restrictive legislation and regulations uh, ranging from uh, BE rules, which uh, prohibit uh, the kind of proper functioning of businesses. There's uh, onerous uh, regulations in the mining sector. The state has custodianship over all mineral rights and uh, the capacity of the state to uh, basically enable business has, has been dramatically uh, impactful on businesses' interests. Um, I wanted to start the conversation just by talking about business advocacy. And it seems to me that the last four years or so have been characterized by this idea of uh, consensus-seeking, social compacting. The president has been a, a champion of that. But yet we see a number of hostile laws continuing uh, to be promulgated and on the statute books. So, Pete, may I start with you? Uh, why do you think this kind of traditional understanding of business advocacy has failed? And what could be an alternative to it? Well, David, um, I can take it uh, even a little bit further back. If we look at the, uh, the history of the far past few hundred years, the state as we know it and its development, <clears throat> there was a, one, of the, uh, one of the things that stand out from statecraft uh, is the idea that the state is responsible for maintaining a healthy economic environment, a healthy environment for business. And often we would hear the people um, legitimate the, uh, legitimize the in, uh, interventions of state laws and so on by saying, well, that's the legitimate role of government. So even in a minimal view of government, people still say that's the role of the state to create, create a, a good environment for business. But at Sarklicha, we say maybe that's not entirely correct. Maybe the responsibility should in the first instance lie with business itself. And certainly in South Africa, we've come to a point where uh, abdicating the responsibility for a favorable environment for business to the state is imprudent. Uh, it is even, I would say, irresponsible. Uh, and we have come to a point where the obvious failures of the approach of lobbying, asking government more nicely and more urgently to do things differently next time, or even right now, just doesn't work. Um, it's not enough to simply ask government. It's not enough to simply present uh, better policies for government to adopt. We need to come to a point where we, instead of lobby for change, negotiate for change. And that's, that's an important mind shift. And at Saaklicha, we certainly say that's what businesses should do. They should internalize the responsibility for creating a favorable environment and see the state as one of the important entities that should be engaged on, uh, on this. But um, not ask the state to take that responsibility more seriously. Just say, uh, be become more strong uh, as businesses, organize and come to a point where we can negotiate with the state to say, this is not acceptable. We're not going to do B in this way. 
et cetera. And I think that's the point where we are now. We've seen a failure of asking the government more nicely. We need to come to a point of insisting more firmly. Now, Russell, Neil Froneman, the CEO of Sabanya Stillwater, the mining company, has said that we need to abandon the consensus-seeking approach and move more towards a transactional approach, similar to what, what Peter's just said. Uh, why do you think business is so inclined towards this uh, kind of uh, social partnership uh, kind of model? Why have they gone along with this? And how do we begin to kind of nudge business towards this more transactional approach? This is a great, great line of questioning. And I'm quite encouraged that people are coming to this realization from different perspectives and from different angles. It's not like we're all getting into a room and coming up with this idea. So that excites me because it it shows that there's sort of a bit of a dawning of uh, perception on this thing. It's intuitively appealing that to create social order, you must agree on everything, okay? Um, the problem is, is that humans and groups and, you know, and, and various different interest groups and so on have such divergent views of the world. And this is what a plurality and, and pluralism is all about. Uh, we have very different views of the world, um, different ideas on how to get where, we, where we're going. So, you know, some of us have different destinations to the extent that we have the same destinations, different means and methods of getting there. And I think when you try and uh, build consensus and, and create, uh, you know, social compacts and so on, you focus on what you end up focusing only on what you can agree on. And very often that's actually very little. Um, so you often only make progress or cooperation on quite trivial matters and you leave unspoken about the things that you really disagree on, which very often is very substantive. And that ends up festering uh, in the background and, and doesn't actually get dealt with and creates tremendous amount of grievance. Um, and I think we've got to move now towards a much more mature uh, method of engagement, which is the idea of making demands, reciprocity, so hearing the other side's demands, figuring out how to, how to uh, react to those demands and, and essentially negotiating a particular position, I, what you've called a more perhaps transactional approach. Far more mature, far more realistic in a society of divergent interests. So it's really encouraging that that seems to be uh, where some thinking is, is is heading now, and we certainly are, are beginning to see quite clearly that 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 understands the creation of social order in a far more uh, in a far deeper and more mature way than, than than pretending that we agree on everything. So, Pete, I mean, if you look around you, you see the state retreating from some of its core functions. And uh, you may have seen reports of Discovery Insure sponsoring fire trucks in the city of Johannesburg. We now have a private fire force. Uh, when I go on my morning runs through the suburbs of Joburg, I see potholes that have been freshly filled in. Discovery's uh, lettering is stenciled on the, on the top because they're taking this initiative. They're literally filling little voids left uh, by the retreating state. Um, but on the other hand, when I go to Woolworths on a Saturday morning, I'm told that I must wear my mask, even though the pandemic is now endemic. And in many ways, you know, the lockdown showed that businesses have actually been a, quite equivocal in terms of their relationship with the state. They've been quite keen to enforce some of these uh, rather arbitrary edicts, or they've just uh, kind of capitulated. Uh, so what has the lockdown taught us about the appropriate role for the corporate sector? Sarkalik has been very involved in business for ending lockdown and has been challenging a number of the lockdown regulations. What are the lessons learned two and a bit years later from this lockdown experience and how can businesses maybe respond a bit differently to, to state overreach in future? There's a paradox. <clears throat> the paradox is that as uh, South Africa, as the country continues down the path of uh, state failure, it's not a failed state, but it's on the path of state failure, and it will continue on this path. There's nothing to suggest that it will s uh, stay that course or, I mean, uh, deviate from that course. So South, Af South Africa is on a path of state failure. Now, the paradox is that as things start to fall apart more and more, as uh, there are millions of people unemployed, there are... Um, uh, 
state hospitals don't work. Um, there are potholes everywhere. You have fire trucks, uh, they're not uh, are coming around. And then we have more than, uh, more, much more private security officers, etc., than police officers. All of that, um, and I, you know, the listeners, the viewers know about many more examples. The state, as the state failure progresses, it seems like the state seizes onto non issues and try and exert its power there. And maybe the, what we've seen now with regard to uh, the treatment of COVID and lockdowns is a harbinger of what we can expect to come. The non-real crises will be pretended to be the core crises. And we will see the state's attention focus away from the things that really need solving because the state is unable to solve them to try and manage um, what is today a non-issue, uh, which is COVID-19. Um, and so there's, that's an interesting paradox. I, I think we'll see more of it. We did see companies um, go along with the uh, state's approach, and we did see many companies deviate from that. I think in general, smaller and medium-sized companies did not go along with the state, and they intuitively knew what was going on. This is harmful. You can't just close business. If you don't make stuff, there won't be any stuff. But we did see uh, among corporates uh, disheartening uh, support uh, and th during some phases of lockdown for government's actions. And I think that's unwise. And I think if we reflect back on that, hopefully we will see some corporates be less uh, inclined to do so in future. But the real uh, importance, uh, and discoveries may be a good example. It was very supportive of lockdown often, um, and it, uh, but it also the, the, you know, fills the potholes and provides f uh, private fire trucks. But again, on the other hand, I just read today that it's also in favor of uh, some form of national health insurance and wants to manage that perhaps, assist the government. So I think there's a, especially going to the large corporates, you will see uh, a certain uh, tensions um, and uh, I think um, it would be wonderful if, these, if, if, if companies in South Africa in general tend to be more independent, and we will certainly see more and more independence from medium-sized and small businesses. Corporates are exposed on many levels to state capture. Yeah, and there is also this problem of a compliance culture in corporates that don't really necessarily question the underlying uh, thrust of regulation. They'll just say, oh, well, we need someone in the compliance department to, to check the boxes. And eventually you become like Gulliver with all of these thousands of Lilliputian uh, strings holding you down. And you kind of wonder how you came into this position. Yeah, I, I could add it's important to sometimes say no. Um, but at a corporate level, that's not always easy because you're uh, exposed, of course, to government intervention. Um, but uh, I think also, um, uh, also often lawyers advise, uh, big companies or lawyers, I found that they advise big corporates comply uh, hold, you know, stay under, stay, keep under the radar, but that's not always the wise thing to do. And if I could just jump in there quickly, it's it comes down to a very deep and important issue, which is, you know, who and what is is sovereign uh, in in the political environment, in the social order. Um, and I think that that starts first and foremost, and you know, and I'll just touch on this now with with a mindset that says um, either everything that the state says and does is kind of legitimate and, and sovereign and, and we must obey, um, or there, is, there are higher laws, um, whether that be uh, uh, you know, spiritual laws or constitutional laws or, or ancient traditions that, that point us toward... Um, you know, certain aspects of the legal tradition that the state can violate. And do we as civil society, as business, as, as organized groups outside of the state, uh, just simply obey the state? And I think this is quite an easy concept for South Africans to grasp because we've come through a history where state policies um, have been considered illegitimate by the vast majority of, of the country. And we're actively disobeyed and fought against, and uh, and that process is now regarded as being very, uh, very legitimate, and the people who did that very brave. So, um, I think it's it, we, when we talk about this stuff, we must talk about this mindset of state sovereignty. And the last point I'll make on this is just to say that, you know, what what you find amongst these corporations is not just obedience per se, but a willingness to to be the enforcement arm. Of the state, that's worrying, and I think uh, businesses businesses need to take a step back and ask themselves, 
why after having paid all their taxes they are still essentially working for the state over and above that for free you know why are they policing uh, these things that the state is requiring um that's something that i think we've got to be you know we've got to focus on and that that whole issue i think is very very important about you know this issue of sovereignty and 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 who and what is sovereign um over, over the country that came through very very starkly uh, in this COVID period. Yeah, and uh, I got into an argument with the manager at the Woolworths this Saturday about legal positivism versus uh, natural law, uh, because he said um, I have to wear my mask because the president said that I must. And uh, I said, well, you know, if the president said that I must not wear blue socks, would you enforce that rule? And he said, no, of course not. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's an aside. I was reading Milton Friedman's uh, essay from, I think it was 1970, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Maximize Its Profit. And he pointed out an interesting contradiction, which is that uh, many uh, business leaders are very strategic and far-sighted in terms of their understanding of their markets, but are perhaps less strategic in terms of their engagement with governments, often going along and endorsing policies that in the long term will harm their, their commercial interests. Why, why do you think that is, Pete? Well, Friedrich Hayek, who was a contemporary of Milton Friedman, made a, another a remark that I'll misapply now. He spoke of the fatal conceit, which was a knowledge problem. But there's another fatal conceit that I think businesses have become accustomed to. That fatal conceit is believing in access to government. So mm. once you're in the mindset, and this is especially the case for big corporates, they tend to um, have access and come to rely upon access to people in political power, whether it's the mayor or a minister or the president or some lobbyist. The lobbying mindset is a fatal conceit because once you start going down that path and it becomes your main um, mechanism for achieving change in the social order, then you uh, are abdicating your responsibility. You are uh, you're neglecting the agency that you have and should apply. And you are, um, you are uh, also uh, diminishing your own authority in being able to say no. You're going to a lobbying position asking for things instead of into a negotiation, negotiating or transactional position. And so uh, when Milton Friedman wrote that essay, you, you made some other points there as well, but I'm, I'm always reminded that today, we are in a mindset where businesses have become accustomed to thinking that their social responsibility is getting government to make different rules. And perhaps businesses' primary social responsibility, their constitutional duty in the deepest sense, not in the, in the written constitution, in the deepest constitutional sense, is to balance power, is to uh, craft and be shapers, not constitutional takers, be constitutional shapers of the order that economically should support a flourishing society if we could just jump onto that um the what you know so important what you've just said and of course what what's happening there is you're actually then feeding state power you're, you're actually feeding that beast by by in, in a supplicant position going to the state and requesting things government's not going to give you things that diminish its power and influence the state's not going to diminish its bureaucratic reach voluntarily. Very seldom does that happen. Um, so I think it's it's very important that exactly what Pete said is this there's this belief about access, but the access itself, um, firstly, isn't that effective, I don't believe, and secondly, it actually feeds state power. So I think in in, in you know in a double sense, it's kind of perpetuating the problem that then requires more access down the line because you're now defending yourself against even more draconian state policy. And I think this is a bit of a doom loop in a way that's, that's taken us into a cul-de-sac and we've got to move, move out of that. Yeah, and as Winston Churchill said, it's like feeding the crocodile and hoping that he will eat you last. Uh, it's not a very effective strategy. Maybe it helps you in the short term, but not in the long term. Right, and Pete, uh, one of the classic examples of government... Uh, overreach and business going along to get along is BE. And Sarkilich has been involved in some quite high profile litigation against particularly the uh, pre qualification criteria for procurement uh, for state contracts. Uh, could you provide a bit of detail on that? What are the origins of this litigation? What is the outcome? And where to from here? Sarkilich litigates against the policy of BE, the, the, the statutes as they are. 
uh, because there's a problem with BEE. That problem does not have to do with the B or the last E, but the black economic empowerment. It has to do with the economic. And in our view, and this is, a, this is an analysis we've done, it, I think it's the proper analysis. If you analyze BEE, there's a problem. It substitutes economics and politics. It gets rid of the economics and it puts politics in charge of capital allocation. Mm. It puts, it's puts politicians in, in, in charge of who gets the capital to provide consumer goods. And it completely reverses um, what is the known recipe for economics. What works economically is where you have consumers signaling desires uh, and appointing capital by choosing the right entrepreneurs. So that's the core problem with BEE. It means it can never succeed. BE can never succeed in South Africa, but we have this expansion. From the 90s, we had a voluntary sort of phase of BE. You move into the 2000s, you have the Procurement Act of 2001, you have the BE Act in 2003, and these acts then combine to set the scene for a multitude of charters and agreements and codes and generic codes and specific codes. Um, and now uh, we're in a final, well, not a final phase, but in a, another expansion phase of BE where we have competition law uh, putting transformation or BE at the heart of itself, uh, where we have uh, all kinds of re regulation in the financial sector, in the property uh, property practitioner sector, all introducing BE. So Sarkali litigates against BE because it's harmful and we need to stop it. And uh, our most successful case so far was the called so-called the uh, preferential procurement framework uh, act. There were some regulations that Pravin Gordon brought back brought in five years ago in 2017. And we had a five-year path of litigation where we uh, got eventually these regulations set aside. And now that again opens the door for anybody to tender. These regulations in 2017, they said that um, the organs of state may say that uh, as a pre-qualification, as a precondition for tendering, you, need, you can only be 100% black. So uh, ironically, that piece of regulation said, uh, you know, white and black people who are together in business, we don't want you. We want only black people who are unwilling to do business with black with white people. That's the it. It actually drove a wedge between people doing business together by saying we're going to introduce a pre-qualification. You have to be 100% black, or you can't um, contender. And so we've set aside that now, but there's a long road ahead. Uh, it's a first step, and I don't want uh, people to be excited too quickly. But I can tell you that we are committed um, over the next decade and more to have BE, the policy of BE, stopped because it's harmful. What's harmful must be stopped. Yeah, I think the great tragedy of BE is that it has instilled this idea that your success as a black business person is contingent on the state acting on your behalf, which breeds a kind of dependency on the state and ultimately on, on politicians as well. So that, that one E is really critical, empowerment. And people become empowered not through being given a, a leg up by some government bureaucrats. It's by you know, creating products and services that can compete in the market. And growth is a, is a fantastic driver of individuals uh, empowering themselves. May I, may I use the word state capture at this point? We, we know state capture in the word it's used with reference to Mr. Gupta's and so on. But there's another kind of state capture. It's capture by the state. And BE is a capture of the, of the commercial sphere by politicians. We're putting politicians in charge of businesses um, and not letting, not, not letting business people be in charge. And so that's, uh, that's, it, it hatch, lag, lag, latches on to this dependency question, but it's in fact putting politicians in charge of the, of the economics of the country, and it is therefore captured by the state. Russell, you want to add to that? I couldn't have said it better. Uh, that is precisely what's going on. And you know, if you had to think of a pernicious and, and very clever and, and deeply embedding uh, mechanism of, of socialism, of, of creating deep state control over the economy, uh, BEE has been a, a very clever mechanism for that by design or by default, uh, whichever you know, one that is. It's, um, it's been able to generate through moral suasion very high levels of corporate compliance. And I think is one of the poster children of this idea that we were speaking about in the previous segment, which is really granting tremendous amount of sovereignty to the state over the commercial sphere, rather than pushing back. And rather than saying, you know, how about we, how about we decentralize um, empowerment? How about we decentralize decision making on uh, on uh, the 
goal, which is, as, as Pete recently said in a, in a talk at the Black Business Council, um, the goal is the flourishing of communities, uh, black communities, white communities, Indian communities, all kinds of communities in South Africa. The goal is that they flourish. It's not that we empower um, hand-picked uh, uh, kind of cronies, you know, and I, and I think it's, it's been very clear to see that that's the direction that BE has taken. So, um, no, I think that's that's very well said. We've seen a an enormous reach into, into, you know, these tentacles have reached deep into South Africa's economy in ways that are not easy to see either. Um, and, and as we sort of unravel this, this, this beast, as it were, we, we can start to see just how pernicious it's been. And we're coming on for 20 years of, of BE as an official policy, 25 years at maybe plus as a kind of unofficial policy into an official policy. And um, that's a long time to misallocate capital in the way that we have. And South Africa is really paying for it now. And that constitutional court judgment was quite favorable, uh, but it was a split judgment. Could have gone either way. What do you think are the limits of litigation as, as part of your strategy? Because in many regards, constitutional court is kind of in the ideological slipstream of the hegemonic idea of transformation. And it's perhaps, you know, there's a risk there that the court might go against you in future judgments on, on other matters, putting aside this case. Yes, it's, it's to be expected that sometimes Sakhlicha will not be successful in court, although we have been in the past five appearances these last two years in the Constitutional Court, we were successful. Uh, but it is to be expected that at some point we will also not be successful, successful and that won't be a sign of failure of the strategy, it's, um, it's uh, to be expected. Um, but the, the, the courts, I, I think we, we should to both at the same time defend and understand the limits of uh, of the courts, as we as, so, as as we should call them, uh, courts are often called independent. And sure, they have a important degree of independence from the executive and from uh, the the, uh, the the legislature, from parliament and from the cabinet. But that does not mean they are independent of the order. They are also part of the state. And so we have this inherent limit with any in any state in the world. This is not a South African problem. In any state, you have. You have thus a system where you ask an, a part of the state to say something about a dispute between somebody outside of the state and the state. So it's not a neutral arbiter, as much as it, of course, tries to be legally prudent. And South Africa has its own flavor of that. And so transformationism, as we can call it, is certainly you find there's a doctrine, an understanding of uh, race, an understanding of transformation that one sees in judgments. And it's, it is to be expected that at some point, Sarklicha will uh, be in tension with that in what we ask of the court. But we understand that limitation. And that means that we also try and approach the courts constructively by understanding the court's proclivities and suggesting to the court solutions. Suggesting to the court, for example, that BE is not an appropriate means to a laudable end. We don't take issue with the end of a flourishing black community or any community in South Africa or a flourishing South Africa. We're saying this means is physically impossible to achieve that end. Or we would do the same with other, other court cases. We try and present the court with solutions to a problem that the court also sees as a problem because BE's failure is obvious to anybody. So the court, there is an amenability there to solutions. Doesn't mean we'll always hit home, but we certainly, uh, we certainly have and will in future also be successful. Yeah, and I think litigation is one prong in a multi-pronged strategy. Yes. But now, Russell, state failure does have a big impact on businesses. The operating environment is very challenging. And a modern economy requires consistent supply of energy, dispatchable energy. Um, what has gone wrong with the energy framework in South Africa? What are the causes of load shedding? And how can businesses start to state-proof themselves and become energy independent? That's probably a three-hour podcast just by itself, but the, the essence of what's happened is that we've uh, centralized the production and distribution of energy. That's been the case for many decades. Um, for a while, that seemed to work to some degree um, the problem with centralization is that you're always just one bad ideology one bad policy one mistake away from the whole thing kind of falling over the you know amongst other things but one one of the important purposes of 
distributed or decentralized production in a, in a market economy uh, is that failure is inevitable. It's not that entrepreneurs are uh, perfectly wonderful and never, and never mess up. In fact, they probably make mistakes more than they succeed. And the only way that that can be mediated into social progress and into, in, into a flourishing order is that those mistakes are decentralized. Those, those mistakes uh, become much smaller and in sort of disparate parts of the system so that when they happen, they don't, they don't collapse the whole thing. Yeah, and failure is almost like a market signal. Failure is a market signal and failure uh, is, is part of growth. Uh, we know that in, individually, right, um, in, in, in our personal lives, failure can, can lead to tremendous growth. And that's very much true for, for market economies. You need to see what doesn't work as much, you know, in, in order to see what does work as well. So ESCOM is this big centralized behemoth. And um, so that's precarious enough. Now, as we saw for decades, it, it can work to produce cheap energy. Uh, but it's, it's now been beset by very bad policies, policies of catered deployment, policies of affirmative action, uh, not, not, not a meritocracy, um, not allowing uh, competition in energy, um, getting hugely bloated staff headcount, running up huge debts, getting bailed out by the state. So this, all these errors are starting to compound. Uh, and the real threat of this is that it's compounding into one gigantic mistake that is potentially fatal for the South African economy. Now, the idea of grid failure has been, you know, touted and, and, and spoken about by experts. Um, the grid failure potentially takes three weeks to a month to, to rectify, if at all, and, certain, and even then parts of the grid may never come back under that kind of scenario. That is, uh, that is the kind of scenario that is real fat tail risk, black swanny, you know, type risk stuff that, you know, you almost don't want to think about, but you, you sort of have to think about a very extreme scenario like that. So what we say at Sarkalicha is, is that that risk, but not just that risk, everything in between here and, and that extreme risk, which is load shedding, which is losing energy for several hours in a day, um, becomes an intolerable risk and a threat to our vital interests, right? Um, this is not a debate between whether the tax rate should be 25 or 26%, and we can have a polite political debate about that. This is, uh, this is kind of life and death. I mean, in, 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 in certain instances where hospitals get cut off of energy and so on, it is literally life and death, and, and uh, that's in the immediate term. And in the longer term, when you uh, lose energy production, you regress, you de-develop, and when you de-develop, uh, life expectancy goes down, mortality rates go up. It's it's a real crisis. So this is a business and community threat to 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 the vital interests of all communities in South Africa. And so what we're saying is that that starts to become an intolerable risk and and something where civil disobedience becomes wholly justified. Um, it you know you shouldn't have to make the moral case. It should be basically self evident that to obey the state's rules on on the energy monopoly. Um, is is not necessarily the ethical position. The ethical position is to produce enough energy so that people can thrive and survive. And the real question becomes, how do you do that when the government is stopping you from doing it, when the government is uh, reserving the right to, to disallow you from doing that, uh, putting energy caps on? Um, so it becomes a, 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 a sort of politico-technical question rather than a, a moral question in my mind. It's, it's unquestionably right to produce sufficient energy for a market that's desperate for it because it's such a critical uh, part of life. So that's that's the kind of setup, I think, for for where Sarkalich is heading and our thinking about this. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Uh, that doesn't really, that there's some questions that remain unanswered as to, as to how we achieve this. But I think the first step is to convince the public, and I think that's going to be a fairly easy job, is to convince the public that the right thing to do is to produce enough energy uh, because a lack of energy uh, is, is, is just an unthinkable risk. Um, and I think we must do that at local municipal government levels. We must also do that in the private sector at, at, at the corporate level. And this is also where we've got to overcome this, this uh, very intense corporate compliance culture where they obey every single dictate of, of the state and actually say, well, who is sovereign 
over energy. Is the state really sovereign over whether I can produce energy and sell it to you, Dave and Sarah, for a price that you agree on? Is the state really sovereign over that? Is that, is that what a free country means, that the government dictates that relationship? And so it's time to really change our thinking on that. Um, and I think it's, the time is right because we've seen just how, what a threat this is. And I think we're, we're going to be able to convince people that this is at least the right direction to start moving in. And once you get a very big social movement in that direction where, you, where you've got business, local governments, and, and the public on your side, um, then I think we're going to be able to make progress in producing energy, whether the law allows us to or not. Recall that um, everybody in South Africa is supposed to pay e-tolls, but there was such a swell of opposition against that um, that it's simply not happening. And it's completely unrealistic to think that we will ever pay the kind of e-toll system that was intended five or ten years ago. And I think in many instances, as the state retreats, as it fails, as it, as it decreases in its ability to maintain the rules it sets, people will step into that vacuum um, and it can either be anarchy or it can be ordered, uh, an, an orderly introduction of alternative provision of the goods and services that the state fails. And exactly how that will take place is unclear, but I think that the future of energy production in South Africa is producers, um, whether for home, home use or for distribution and selling, step into the void left by the state and de facto provide energy in a decentralized way. P providing a product. Providing a product. To consumers. You know, what, That's the future. We've turned this into this political beast. It's just providing a product to consumers. It's called electricity. You know? So we, we've got to, I think we can really shift the thinking on that. That's one of our goals. Yeah, and I mean, it's one thing for, say, a professional services firm to put a solar panel on the roof or have an a uninterrup uninterrupted power supply, but an industrial economy requires scale. You can't run an aluminium smelter off of solar panels and uh, windmills. Um, so do you think that that's maybe the next challenge is how to coordinate energy production and achieve that scale? I don't think we need to coordinate too much. Um, precisely because this can be provided in a dis, uh, in a decentralized way. Um, it, it's how we, don't, we, sh we shouldn't be in the business, we don't intend to be in the business of setting up, uh, setting up uh, power, uh, you know, uh, uh, power stations, um, but I know that some mines are doing very interesting things in this regard. Um, but what we see our role as is creating the um, social momentum and the regulatory um, framework in which this can be done um, without undue risk of expropriation and um, as certainly as the state fails and its capacity to enforce its own uh, arbitrary and harmful rules, that makes our job easier. I, th I think there's a meta-coordination uh, role to be played, whether that's Sarkalicha or us, you know, plus other actors in society. Um, yes, yeah, so, so it's not about building a power station, and but, you know, that whole process requires some level of coordination in what at least initially will be a hostile regulatory and legal environment and and there's going to be real skill required to to navigate that and i think you know we will take on that role uh, along with other social partners who, who who can help us in that um but i think so sarkalicha so sees itself at least contributing to the, the the kind of meta coordination that's required and it's you know that, at that level it is quite substantial right so we're talking about building an independent business community what does that mean and how do we get there it means that if the state fails um, the business community has developed and is able to provide alternative institutional mechanisms for business to continue so we can't make the ability to do business hinge on government's ability to provide uh, the rules of the game and maintain them we need to be able to provide them ourselves that's the one aspect of it the second aspect of it is being is is being able to say no to harmful interventions. So state failure takes harm, the form of harmful interventions as well as absence of institutions. We need to provide institutions, whether it be dispute resolution or coordination mechanisms, uh, to to in in the meta sense for electricity provision, um, or whether it's an affiliated network of affiliates of chambers of commerce solving their own towns. Uh, 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 economic environments those are all institutional examples um, to, to to step into the void of state failure and then there is the ability to say no 
to actively oppose harmful intervention. Um, and certainly that is the direction um, we are going. And I think that's the direction, I, I, I think that's the only direction in which we see a flourishing economy and a flourishing society in South Africa is independence uh, at a business level. Institutional replacement and um, reform um, where possible. Yeah, I think, I think just to say that an independent business community is one that takes up its constitutional obligation to check state power, um, not to feed state power, uh, but to actually check it, work constructively alongside uh, that at times, um, and be in that posture where it can say no uh, and where it, can, where it can check state power. I think that's really, really critical. Um, and, and the mindset, unfortunately, up until now, not just in South Africa, but m in most of the world, has been that, that business and, and you know, the civil society around, around the commercial dimension um, is somehow there to do the state's bidding, is, is somehow operating at the mercy of the state. Um, we, have to, we have to change that, that mindset from getting out from underneath the state to getting alongside and co-creating the social order with other spheres of, of life as well, you know, whether it be schools or churches or you know, everything else. Um, and that mindset is the mindset of independence. And the rule of law is obviously very important in a modern economy. Uh, but this idea of civil disobedience, um, I would imagine that many business owners are going to be quite cautious in what fights they choose and don't want to be on the wrong side of the law or to be disrespectful of the law. I think it's important, uh, Russell used the word constitutional duty. And it's important to understand what we're suggesting businesses do in becoming more independent is taking up a constitutional duty. It is eminently in support of the rule of law. Um, it is um, keeping an eye on the ball, which is the, the ultimate aim is a flourishing society and a flourishing economy. It's not to make sure that some government department works. Yeah, that's, if, if that's the means that serves the end, sure, but that's not the only means. And so at Sarklicha, we understand that businesses are often exposed to risks. Um, uh, that can be, um, it can be further intervention or it can be, uh, uh, it can be um, uh, governments doing investigations or sending inspectors for uh, labor, etc. And so what, what we suggest and the, the way in which we approach this is by going in a responsible manner. Uh, we say it's our constitutional duty and we're looking for ways to negotiate alternative arrangements. I'm not st selling, telling simply uh, telling business people, uh, you know, ignore all laws and uh, it's just do what you want. We're saying the, the reality is we need to find, we need to rearrange, we need to reshape the order and, um, and you know, navigate with, within that. Our uh, final point on this is I think where uh, we must remember, recall that South Africa, as the state fails, approaches less order. It approaches anarchy, and what we're asking businesses to do is turn the tide on that, go toward order. Not, we're not asking for disorganization, disorderly behavior. We're eminently asking for support of a constitutional order. All right, Russell, I mean, you mentioned decentralization. That's a theme that comes up a lot on this podcast. Why is that important for businesses uh, to kind of adopt this decentralized mentality? touched on it a little bit already with the ESCOM explanation. Um, centralized orders are prone to uh, very large, uh, large scale failure. So a centralized political order pretends to have the answers for very complex systems. Um, it doesn't. Uh, that is to some extent that fatal conceit. That's to some extent that, that pretense of knowledge. There's a knowledge problem. There's a calculation problem in, in trying to centralize all these decisions. And the rule of thumb is, is roughly that the larger the, the, the political entity, the larger the geography, the larger the population, the more disparate the population, the less centralization you can afford. Um, the more you have to decentralize political decisions and business decisions even down to, to local levels where very specific conditions uh, uh, arise. It's very, it's very different to, to operate politically, economically, from a business perspective in uh, KwaZulu-Natal than it is in the Karoo for all sorts of reasons, culturally, geographically, uh, you know, from a climate perspective, everything. Um, so I think uh, this is the idea that um, 
humans don't possess all knowledge. Governments struggle to to uh, to to possess knowledge even of very sort of small local environments. It's very difficult even for government to run a single department effectively, let alone um, all aspects of a country of 60 million or 300 million or whatever the number is. So um, I think the idea of decentralization is in first sense, is in the first sense the idea of, of uh, epistemic humility and the humility of, of what humans are capable of. And it says, let's, let's assume um, rightly so that, that uh, humans are f- fairly incapable and need to focus initially just on problems that are locally. And then to the extent that they're successful at that, potentially in a scale appropriate way, coordinate it at slightly higher levels of scale for, for slightly more complex problems that span over different jurisdictions or what have you and, and kind of build up from there. Um, and unfortunately, what we see in South Africa, and again, very much a global problem, has been a centralization um, even though we've got a federal constitution on paper, the practice of South Africa's living constitution, as it were, has been quite intense centralization. That's something that we think is a is a major threat uh, to to future of flourishing society and flourishing order in South Africa. And so we are very uh, supportive of initiatives to decentralize both the political order and the commercial order and take decision making powers away from the center. Uh, and I'll finish on this by saying that we saw a perfect example almost of this intense centralization through lockdowns. We got a one-size-fits-all virtually policy solution for 60 million very different people. That shouldn't be allowed to happen again. So Pete, just as we bring this conversation to a close, what we're not saying is that businesses must become isolated. That's not independence. I mean, I suppose what we're really talking about is interdependence. Um, how do you, people watching this show or listening to it, how do they go about instilling this kind of culture of independence and also working with other like-minded businesses to achieve some of the objectives that we've spoken about today? It's not a Lone Ranger project. Becoming independent um, is only possible in cooperation and coordination with others uh, in different forms in civil society. Um, and now we're speaking about the commercial way in which people cooperate. And of course, there is the instance where you can form a business and it's very organized toward mostly the, the uh, you know, financial profit motive. And that's all good and well. But if we only organize on that principle as businesses, we may be successful in ensuring a niche profit. We may profit on the way down as the... You know, as South Africa to back in the downslopes, we may see um, some businesses doing very, very well. Um, But in the end, there won't be a social order for us to do it all for. What is the end of being successful as a business if you don't want to live in that place anymore? You don't want to store your wealth there. Um, If there's nothing to to uh, to fight for or to conserve. And so the independence we speak of at Sarklicha is the independence found in cooperation with others toward a higher duty. In this case, the constitutional duty of businesses to shape the constitutional order such that it provides a flourishing economy, because that's what a flourishing society needs. Independence means making that responsibility your own, having an internal locus of control and not abdicating that to a government or a state or anybody else. Peter Leroux, I think that that is a perfect point to end this conversation. Russell Lamberti, I wanted to thank you as well. Thanks, Dave. And I hope that this can be the start of many more conversations around achieving true business independence in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you for tuning in to this special episode of Solutions with David Ansara. I really hope that you enjoyed this uh, unique in-person format as much as I did. Uh, Please do let me know your thoughts in the comment section below if you're watching on YouTube. How did you find this uh, in-person version of the show? Also, if you're listening on your preferred podcast platform, please do subscribe there as well. My name is David Ansara. This is the Solutions Podcast. Until next time, take care.